I want to talk about Bitcoin now. And this is going to be really boring. And the reason I don't sort of put out the agenda for the cuddle, like, ever, is because people make um, their opinions. Like, oh, my God, I know. Like, if I said today, you can come here and learn about Bitcoin, you're like, <laughs> boring. I know about Bitcoin. Move on. Tell me something. I want some alpha. Tell me some sexy stuff I don't know. But I still think it's worth talking about some parts of Bitcoin that we're probably not familiar with. Uh, so this mini presentation is all about Bitcoin as economic oxygen. So what is money? Money really is crystallized work energy. That's pretty much it. That's what it should be. And that's what it originally started out as. You do amounts of work, and then you get paid in response to that. And so the money you get from that work is crystallized work energy, uh, or, crystal, or, or a call option on time. That, that's another way to look at what money is. Um, and so throughout the ages, we have used everything as money or, or currency. Uh, we've used seashells, we've used wood, paper, metal, uh, rocks, limestone. We, there, there isn't anything that we haven't used for money. We've even used sex as money. Um, like, th there's so many things out there. But eventually, um, civilization sort of landed on gold and silver about about 3,000 years ago, roughly. But over the last 2,400 years, we've had very accurate um, data or records of, uh, of money. Now, what, what everyone thinks gold has always been money. It hasn't. Humans have actually landed on silver first. So we've always used silver as currency and money as a store of wealth. And that's what humans landed on because, it, it, you know, back in the day, human population grew roughly 2% per year. And back in the day, gold was extracted from the ground at roughly 2% per year. And therefore, the value of gold always stayed flat and silver. It always stayed flat. And that's, I think, the main reason why gold has maintained its relative value um, for all that time. And so, but the thing is, We've now, uh, oh, we need paper, oh, we, we need sound. So, um, basically, we, we, gold is inefficient. So if you had loads and loads of gold and you wanted to move country, how hard is it to lug you know, a ton of gold from one place to the other? It's inefficient. Um, and so we ended up using paper. And paper, we laugh, but that is actually money. Um, so if you look at the old US dollar, it used to be $1. One dollar used to be an equivalent amount of gold in the Federal Reserve Treasury until 1970, uh, yeah, 1971, 15th of August, when Nixon uh, got the dollar off the gold standard. And so now it's a Federal Reserve note. So the US dollar is now a Federal Reserve note, not an exchange for gold. And Really, the, the reason we started using paper uh, and or money as a ledger is due to the Knights Templar. They're really um, the murdering <laughs> bastards that sort of coined money uh, as we know it. Because the Knights Templar, during the Crusades, basically went all over the Europe and Middle East just savaging people, right? Believe in God, no, <laughs> dead. Um, so um, they, they did these massive campaigns from the UK all the way down to you know, Persia. Um, and they were really rich. They were the, the noblemen of, of the UK. And they had tons of gold to fund their campaigns. But what they found, it was a massive ball lake and lugging tons of gold across freaking the, the planet, basically. So what they did is they teamed up with um, a network of Jewish families, and they started creating these bullion houses, or these banks. And what happened is that throughout points of Europe and Middle East, they would deposit, let's say they would deposit all of their gold into the London one. This is the London branch. And that bank would give them a depository note. And that depository note is going, this knight owns you know, X amount of ounces of gold. And this depository note was valid and legal tender in other bullion banks across Europe and, and, and the Middle East. And, and therefore, they could go on their massive campaigns, slaughter as many people as they want, and then if they needed a top-up, they go to their ATM in whatever country it is. So that's really how money as we know it came. So money is simply a ledger. It's literally just a spreadsheet of going, I own, I own this, blah. 
And so, obviously, you know, basically all of my uh, presentation today is really based around sort of Elon Musk, uh, Michael Saylor, Jason Lowry, and whatnot. And this is a very good explanation of what money actually is. And don't forget, this guy was pretty deep with X.com and, uh, and PayPal. I, mean, I think the cryptocurrency thing is an interesting approach to reducing the um, error in the the database that is called money. Um, you know, I think I have a pretty deep understanding of the of what money actually is on a practical day to day basis because of PayPal. Um, you know, we really got in deep there. Um, and r right now, the money system, actually, for you know, practical purposes, is 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 really a bunch of uh, heterogeneous uh, mainframes running uh, old COBOL. <laughs> okay, you mean literally? That's literally. That, that literally, what's happening in yeah. batch mode? Okay, in batch mode. Yeah, uh, uh, pity the poor bastards who have to maintain that code. Okay, that's a that's a pain. That's pain. Not even Fortran. It's COBOL. Yep, it's COBOL. It's like, and they still the banks are still buying mainframes in 2021. And running ancient COBOL code, uh, and uh, you know the the Federal Reserve is like probably even older than the, what the banks have, and they have an old COBOL <laughs> mainframe. <laughs> and so now, the, and, and so the, the the government effectively has editing privileges on the on the money database, um, and they use those editing privileges to um, make more money <laughs> whenever they want, and this increases the error in the database that is money. So if you, I think money should really be viewed through the lens of uh, information theory, and uh, and so it's uh, you know kind of like uh, like an internet connection. Like what's the bandwidth, uh, you know, to total bit rate? Uh, what is the latency jitter, uh, packet drop? Uh, you know, errors in, errors in the network uh, communication. Just think of money like that, basically. Um, I think that's probably the right way to think of it, and and then say what what system. Uh, from an information theory standpoint, allows an economy to function the best, uh, and you know, um, crypto is an attempt to reduce the the error uh, in, uh, in in money that is contributed by uh, governments uh, d diluting the money supply uh, as basically a pernicious a pernicious form of taxation. So. What he's I basically think the cryptocurrency saying, thing. Uh, oopsie, is that money, as of today, from a practical standpoint, is thousands of lots of heterogeneous, lots of different or a big mix of mainframes maintaining a ledger. So imagine a spreadsheet maintained by a bank, and they're, they're running old COBOL, and that, that's basically a very, very primitive uh, form of coding. And they, and as he said, it's spot on there. They have editing privileges, so. The Federal Reserve has a massive mainframe or a bank of mainframes that maintain this ledger of what, what is money, and they have editing pri privileges. So they can literally just type X amount of one, zero, 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 enter, and that's now new money. Um, and then it percolates down through the federal, you know, the open market, um, uh, uh, oh my God, uh, open market operations, sorry. So, but the thing is, this leads to something which is called the Cantillon effect, or I prefer to call it the, the Cantillon benefit. So if you're the Federal Reserve or a bank or a central bank or whatnot, and you've just suddenly plucked out $5 trillion out of your ass, or not, let's say a, tr a trillion dollars out of your ass, plop, you now have a trillion dollars that the world has not seen before. And it's like you going to a, a pick and mix shop and going, right, what am I going to buy? But the thing is, because the world has not seen this trillion dollars, you can buy anything you want at current market prices. Because that trillion dollars hasn't hit the world yet. So you, this is why I call it the Canton benefit. Because you can basically create and invent new money and buy whatever you want at current prices. Now, historically, what happens is that the, <clears throat> all of this new funny money is absorbed by the banking sector. Because that's where it, it flows. And so the banks also have uh, uh, somewhat of a, uh, a diluted Canton benefit. And what happens? All of that money goes into the same typical assets, stocks and property. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is why you can also look at the stock market as 
a pretty interesting uh, barometer of inflation because what's happening right now is huge amounts of corporate buybacks. So you have uh, effectively unlimited free money out there. Big corporates are going out and borrowing money for free or you know, 25 basis points and they're borrowing billions. And what are they buying? They, have, they effectively have this Cantillon benefit. And they're going out and buying back their own stock, their own shares. They're, they're trying to gobble it, it all up to increase their earnings per share. Uh, and, and therefore, I would say the S&P 500 is pretty much the, the, one of the best uh, gauges of inflation, as in price inflation, not monetary inflation. They're two different things of inflation. You always have to understand when someone's talking about inflation, which type they're talking about. Are they talking about monetary inflation or price inflation? Monetary inflation is the expansion of the currency supply. Price inflation is what happens to prices once that ex ex expanded currency supply eventually percolates down into the economy. And remember, price is like a massive sponge. It will just absorb whatever, curr whatever currency is put on it. Uh, and because of this Cantillon benefit, this is one of the reasons we have that rich-poor divide getting ever bigger. So right now, the top 1% of the planet owns more than the bottom 90% of the planet in terms of assets because they can print out the money and them and their crony friends go out and buy assets. So property, stocks, basically. Fine arts, fine wine, uh, pre prestige assets, basically. Um, and then when you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, that is that. It is basically an endless amount of money printing, which then enters the economy at some point. Now, there is always a lag, obviously. Um, so the Cantillon benefit Lots of different people get various forms of the Cantillon benefit, but when you look at it over a space of six to 12 months, you then get, um, or really sort of 12 to 24 months, that's when the price is, starts to sort of represent all the extra currency supply. Uh, and I always say this, like I use water as an example. Let's say we're in, in, in a desert, now water, a hot desert, and we're sweating our, our I was gonna say, yeah, uh, and we're sweating. So the water is now going to be very expensive. So if there's a certain amount, um, let's say the, the, the total amount of um, water assets in this room is 100 pounds, right? And let's say there's 100 pounds of money, that money eventually, over time, uh, and let's say that same amount of water is then replenished, um, th th you know, there's going to be 100 pounds of assets, 100 pounds worth of money. But if I suddenly pluck out another 1,000 pounds out of my wallet and then start buying as much water as possible, I have that Cantillon benefit. I can buy up as much, nearly all of the water, before it then that, that effect of my new funny money has on, on, on this local economy. And then, guess what will happen to the price of water? It will then shoot up. So there's, it's not a coincidence that pretty much every single thing in your life right now is rocketing up in price. It's due to currency printing. Um, and as I said, it is a, it's a price sponge. And the thing is, this, all, all of this money is just going to stocks and property. That's pretty much where it goes. Uh, it's not going down to us. So, so there's a, a form of economics called trickle-down economics. It's largely bollocks, um, because it, didn't, it, it doesn't really trickle down to the economy. So the, what, the, what the central banks have always tried to do, uh, this is what quantitative easing is. They're like, right, we need to stimulate the economy and get liquidity into the local economy. So they have this fire hydrant, and they go, right, on, hoping the water is going to spray down to everyone in, the, in this room, let's say. But what they forgot was the, the absolute um, resourcefulness and the buggeriness of banks. The banks went, oh, cheers, and they literally just put their mouth around this fire hydrant, and they absorb all of it. So the Federal Reserve is like, come on, let's get this water into the economy. And the banks are just like, like, like all going down their throat, just soaking it all up. And so it's this cat and mouse game between the central banks and the banks and the public. Oh, was, and the commercial banks and then the public. And so the, the small bits of water that are going out of the primary lenders, other bankers are, are lapping it up. And so the public never gets it. So that is what quantitative easing is. They're, they're trying to force the banker's hand. But that what they didn't really understand is that the bankers will just absorb as much of it as possible, like nearly all of it. Um, and so that's why quantitative easing doesn't work. It just creates, it enhances the rich-poor divide. The only way um, uh, QE or a form of money printing would work to actually help the economy is helicopter money, as in where the money goes directly to your bank account.
And that's where CBDCs are coming in, uh, so central bank dis, uh, digital currencies. Um, and as, as I said in the trading pub yesterday, they are not money, they are not currency, they are coupons. That is literally all they will be. So you will, and by the way, I was talking about CBDCs when it was a conspiracy theory, by the way. So a good six years ago, uh, I, I, like, I see Mike there. I, I, we've known each other for probably a decade now. And how long have we been talking about CBDCs? Fricking years. To the point where, Siam, you're such an idiot. You know, bank, you know the, the banks will never create their own cryptocurrency. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Everything I said five years ago, and by the way, it's documented on YouTube. I've, um, every single thing I've said about CBDCs is coming true right now. To the point where every central bank on the planet, so the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, Bank of England, all, et cetera, they're all about to roll out their CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. But the thing is, they, they've obviously watched my YouTube channel and they've, they've realized how to implement this. Uh, and, and one of my videos told them how they should do it. And if I was a bastard banker and I had the CBDC, what would I do with it? I wouldn't. So first of all, this, I'll tie this in with U U uh, UBI, so universal basic income. But obviously, you plebs don't know how to manage money, right? So me, by the way, I'm a ba banker, not Siam kid. I'm a central bank bastard now. Um, you don't know how to, to, to spend your money. You're just going to plow it in drugs and alcohol. That's what you lot will do. So I'm, I'm going to be the responsible parent for you. I'm going to give you 500 pounds a month, OK? I'm, I'm going to be good like that. I'm going to give you all 500 pounds a month. But you can only spend it at certain places. Sainsbury's. My mate, Sainsbury's. Uh, you, can, you can spend it on Amazon. My mate Bezos will ha be happy with that. He'll look after you. Uh, you can spend it in all these selected stores. But I want liquidity in the, in the community, so I'm not going to let you save it. So it's going to be time stamped. So here, you can have these bullshit tokens um, that you can spend with all my mates' stores, but there'll be a time stamp. Call it 30 days. There we go. Oh, and if you're a bad boy and girl, I'll just cut you off. So any bad hate speech on Facebook? Sorry, no money this month. Um, and then before you know it, we're in full-blown social economic credit school like China. I know it sounds really kooky. I said this five years ago. It's happening right now. What is Justin Trudeau doing in Canada right now? He is freaking being, it is like modern day China has just suddenly overtaken Canada um, to the point where there was this lady who donated $10 to that trucker uh, movement on a, Go, on a GoFundMe page. She got her bank accounts frozen for a month. $10 contribution. The other lady that created the GoFundMe page is now in jail. It's, it's, just, it's just insane. So this is where it's coming. When the, when the Bank of England rolls out their digi pound, or they, won't, they won't call it crypto pound, but it will have, to, it is basically a crypto. When they roll out digi pound, there will be a mass advert campaign across the country. They'll get all sorts of celebrities. They'll roll the same old celebrities out and go, hey, get your e-wallet or get your pound wallet or whatever, and, and you'll have this brand new wallet, which only accepts digi pounds. Um, and then, yeah, it will be time stamped, um, and you can only spend it in certain places. You will not be able to put it into crypto. You will not be able to buy probably, oh, you'll probably allow you to buy stocks, only certain selected stocks. Um, it'll probably go towards a mortgage because, again, that just helps the banking sector. So just look out for this. All I am doing as the realistic trader community, well, we, it's more of a bullshit detector, really, and then you make your, your own minds of what happens, what you do. So remember, weak money always loses. Every single point in history where there has been a weak money, guess what? The strong money comes and absolutely destroys it. So, uh, you, like for example, for hundreds of years, loads of different countries and tribes in East Africa have used glass beads, right? But then the Europeans came along a few hundred years ago and go, huh, there's nice arbitrage here. We can make glass for like nothing. And then what happens if you, you know, just plow millions or billions of glass beads on a community? Guess what? That, that currency, that weak currency is now worth nothing, and the Europeans then own Africa. Hence, slavery came around. Uh, oh, no, no, that's not one of the reasons, but that was one of the byproducts of owning, you know, destroying a weak currency with your slightly stronger currency, you then own the place. Just take the, 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 the island of the Yap. 
So if, for those of you who have seen some of my early YouTube videos, I said that, that in the island of Yap in the, in the South Pacific, there's uh, a, a bunch of islands where they use these massive limestones with little holes in. So some of them will be bigger than me, they have a hole, and what they used to do was basically sort of like, they'd have a, they would actually etch into the stones a ledger. Like, you borrow, you, I sold you 15 sheep, and you gave me 100 turkeys in exchange, and they'd write these on these big old stones. What happens? The Europeans came along and went, ha, huh, these islands worship stones, and on this island over here, there's shitloads of stones. Hmm, okay, let's just import these stones onto this island. They bought everyone up, they had the Cantillon benefit, and then they owned the island. Slavery, again. Um, Europeans are great, aren't they? Um, so weak money always uh, loses to strong money. Um, and so roughly there's, what, 66 dollarized countries on the planet at the moment. There's another 130 non-dollarized uh, countries. All of the non-dollarized countries are doing a lot worse than the dollarized uh, countries. And the dollarized countries are doing pretty shit because the dollar is dying. Uh, and if you, oh, I should have, damn it. I, uh, all morning I've been trying to think of this one chart that I've forgotten. I've just now remember, remembered. It's the chart of Bitcoin against the US dollar. And the US dollar is doing this against Bitcoin. Um, so, but yeah, here, there, oh yeah, I've got some pictures. That's a, a Yap currency stone. Uh, and then some African glass beads. So, but yeah, um, here's another chart of basically the US dollar since the 1900s. The purchasing power of that just drops and drops and drops. We all know this. Some, for a lot of people here, this is nothing new. So basically printing equals price inflation. I got a lot of jip in some of my YouTube videos, videos and go, oh, this guy knows nothing about inflation. Inflation is the CPI, you know, as in the consumer price index, which some of you know, the, consumer, the CPI basket is basically a basket of metaphorical goods which the government goes, right, what does everyone use every day? Uh, groceries, milk, petrol, blah, blah, blah. And they, they track the prices of, of stuff today, what it was last year, two years ago, et cetera, and go, ah, oh, that's inflation. And because the banks want 2% inflation, that's the Goldilocks figure, they, they dick around this basket to maintain low, in, uh, low uh, inflation. But they remove things. Um, so, you know, some asset could be going completely nuts, like cod in the North Sea. So they go, oh my God, this is hurting our basket. So let's remove cod and put hake in, or crab sticks, or whatever. Um, so it's a manipulated basket of metaphorical goods. Um, but what is the biggest outgoing in everyone's life? Rent or mortgage. That's pretty much everyone's biggest outgoing. Why is not that not in the frickin' CPI basket? Hmm. It used to be in the 1970s until they got rid of it when Thatcher and Reagan started the every man must own his own home policy. So you have to understand that we are the frogs. We are the frogs being boiled alive. And what tends to happen, going back to those seven, um, seven, seven stages of civilization, um, we end up paying, we, we end up in wars that we don't really want to fight, and we, we, we fund it with money we don't have. And, and what tends to happen is that we, we can sort of run that sham for five to ten years until the public w wakes up, by which point, you know, most of us are dead. Um, but the thing that causes sort of revolutions is this. When price inflation, so that, remember that massive sponge, gets big and big and big, when it gets to the point where um, on average, a nation's food, so it, it, where an average family is spending more than 40% of their take-home income on food, that's where you see civil uprising. We saw it in Egypt a few years ago. Pretty much most civil uprisings are due to food, as in they're spending too much money or of their take-home money on food. And so then the risk-to-reward um, seesaw comes in. It's like, do we revolt and then have regime change and you know, we can get better things, or do we not? You know, what was the risk of revolting? When, when we hit this level here, historically for thousands of years, by the way, that is when you see uprisings. We're not there yet, not in the UK. We probably won't be there for a long time. Um, but yeah, and this is my sneaky suspicion. Again, I oh, didn't bring my tinfoil hat here. Um, my, my sneaky suspicion is that we're moving very much, very quickly to a, a plant-based food world where, you know, we can already see it, you know, don't eat beef, don't eat all that sort of stuff because it's bad for the planet, yada, yada. Everything will come under climate change. And before you know it, the whole planet will, will be eating plant-based stuff. 
But all that's happening is that they're basically, they're going to be turned, they can produce this plant-based stuff in a factory at larger quantities, like, so it's going to be like Amazon, you know, and, and it's a way for them to control our food intake, but without letting the prices go nuts. So at the moment, because we're, you know, we're very cattle-based sort of, um, a cattle-based eating society, as, 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 as it were, um, you know, food, uh, food prices are very much um, the, the long-tail result of energy prices. So if oil goes up, and water prices go up, and wheat goes up, you know, I think something like 30 to 40% of all the wheat that's made on the planet is there for just for cows and livestock. And, and, so, and so our food chain is very much dominated by energy prices. Well, when you get rid of that, and we just, you know, we're all eating bloody pea protein mixers from whatever, they can control that price up um, ebb and flow. Uh, by the way, I, I, I haven't eaten beef or pork or anything for about 60 years now, um, so I'm not, like, shitting on vegetarians or anything. I'm, I'm pretty much a veggie. Um, <clears throat> I destroy whole economies of chicken, though. Um, so, <laughs> <coughs> so, remember... Inflation is a relative vector. So at the moment, we're using, you cannot use simple arithmetic to measure inflation. Inflation is a complex fluid. It is, and it's all relative. So it's just like you know, air going over a, 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 an aerofoil. You cannot use simple arithmetic for that. You need interdimensional algebra and, and calculus to you know, calculate uh, forces. And, it's, and, and this is the key word. It's a relative vector. So the inflation is different for every single person in this room. It is not the CPI lie, which the government says it is. Everyone is different. So if you're like some big fat cat capitalist, what are the things that that big fat cat capitalist spends their money on? Stocks, expensive properties, as in like prestige properties, and probably cars, right, and private jets. Inflation for that person will be what is the average price movement on those assets. So if they're you know, an investor and they're stocks and property, well, guess what? The last 30 years, stocks and property have increased roughly 15% per year. So for that person, inflation is 15% per year, roughly, or more. If you're you know, a Gen Z living in your mother's basement, not really spending anything, and all you do is party and watch Netflix, what's inflation? Pretty damn nothing. The price of Netflix doesn't grow that much every, every year. Um, and price of alcohol, I have no idea. As, does alcohol go up much every year? Uh, in, there we go. So basically, minimal inflation for that you know partier, you know uni student basically living on pot noodles. Pot noodles, they, they go up in price. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Inflation is different for everyone. Okay. Um, so if you live in a, in a developing world, inflation. Is, is really dependent on, on energy prices. What, what is oil doing right now? So oil is, at, you know, all not all-time highs. It's pretty damn high, 100 $105 a barrel. This is not good for develop, developing nations. That long-tail negative effect is going to hurt Africa, really going to hurt Africa. Um, but we won't see the effects of that, not this year, not next year. Probably a few, you know, we'll probably see famines over, over this. It's a relative vector. So... Whoever smelt it, dealt it. Whoever denied it, supplied it. I think we've all heard of that. We are now in this weird situation where the people in that are causing the inflation are the people lying to us about inflation, um, which is why I put this piece here. We all think we know what inflation is, but most people don't. And I just want you to understand it's different for everyone, depending on who you are, what you buy, what you spend, what you spend time on. And so as Bitcoin Jesus correctly says, the price of everything is varying everywhere at different rates all the time. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. The price of everything is varying everywhere at different rates all the time. So as I said, over the last 30 years, um, ah, so go back one. <coughs> No, maybe not. Um, I actually look at the, the M2 money supply as the actual direct indicator of global inflation. So what 
M2, it, so there are four ways to sort of measure the money supply, M0, M1, M2, M3. Uh, but most people look at M2. It's, it's, it's not the broadest money supply, but it's basically all currency in, it, in circulation, stuff in your bank accounts, some forms of debt. Um, so that's the money supply, the M2 currency supply. Um, so when, when you look at the M2 currency supply over the last 30 years in the UK, it's gone up 16.2% per year. Isn't it interesting how stocks have also gone up roughly 15% per year over the last 30 years? Hmm. In the US, it's slightly lower, around 15.32%. So to all the naysayers on YouTube saying, you don't understand inflation, I freaking do. Inflation is the M2 money supply, pretty much. If you wanted to have a, a rough you know, thumb in the air, thumb, forefinger in the air, um, that's what inflation is. Which is why I have... Like, it, there is no, it is by design, not by coincidence, that the only things I do in life are business and crypto. Why? Because that is the hurdle, 15%. I want to get rich. I, don't, I have no qualms in saying that. I want to get filthily rich, not because I want to live on a freaking yacht. I want to do things. And unfortunately, you can't do big things unless you have personal monetary wealth. And so... I have this hurdle of 15% per year because if your money is making less than 15% per year, you're getting poorer every year. So you have to be obsessed with that 15%. And I don't want to just make 15% and just break even because you're not gain, going anywhere. So I don't get out of bed for anything less than 25%. Ultimately, I don't really like anything less than 50% per year because that's the only way to get out of that sort of that... Uh, it's not a bad thing, but I don't want to live a life of mediocrity. I want to do shit. I want to do some, some silly things in my life, and they need money. Therefore, I must not accept anything really lower than 25 50% per year. So what on the planet consistently gives you more than 15% per year or more than 25% per year? There's not much. This is why I'm not in property. Um, the only things I do is business and crypto. And I've said this, uh, sorry for those who are hearing this as a repeat again. Um, when you look at the world of business, I, and what I found out from bitter experience, and also uh, I saw it coming, is that when you get to sort of a million pounds EBITDA, your business growth really does start to plateau. So if, you're, if you've got a business making about, a, you know, let's call it 500 grand a year profit, your, the, your rate of growth really starts to decline. When you get to about a million pound a year profit, it is really hard to grow. You, you'll probably only, you know, if you're doing well, you'll probably only grow 15, 20% per year. And however, going from zero to sort of, you know, 10 to 40 grand a month profit, your growth over, the, you know, the first five to 10 years is quite spectacular. There are businesses I've set up which are doing, that have done 100% growth year on, year out for, you know, at least five or six years. And I, I figured, ah, because I'm a bit of a, a reprobate, I'm not the type of person to be, you know, the CEO of a big fat cat company. I like dicking around in the small businesses. But by, and so the goal has always been dick around in the smaller business and try and get those 100% growth year on, year out. And then eventually, I'm going to have a nice group of businesses which amass into a top code will actually be, by default, a relatively large business. And so my whole business life has always been get a business to 20 grand a month profit autonomously. So get, it, get the business up, get the team in place so it's running itself so it doesn't need you, step back as much as you can and see if the, if the plane crashes. Um, if the plane does crash, get in before it crashes and then try and do things. But it, like, take the realistic trader. Like, we've streamlined this down so well now. Uh, at one point, RT had 10 staff and it was too bloated. And now we've got three lovely people in the corner over there. Actually, for most of the time, it's been two lovely people. Um, and so we found the nice sort of uh, team maintenance sort of equ equilibrium of two to three people. And how much work have I done for this cuddle, folks? Be honest. Zero. <laughs> Other than the slides, which, you know, I, I have done the slides. But I literally rocked up today and it was like this. I'm like, yeah. So big round of applause for Lewis, Becca, and Matt. Honestly, I... <clears throat> Honestly, I, I do mean it. Like, you, you guys are lifesavers. Um, just like if you ever ask me a question about RT, I'm like, no idea. Don't even know how to log into the systems these days. Um, so, yeah, so that's the goal. Set up a business, get it to sort of 20, 30 grand a month profit, and then only once it's then doing its thing, then move on to the next thing. 
Uh, when you look at the rates of growth, it's far beyond 15%. So that's the business side. That's why I, I, I like to inter uh, interview Elliot, wherever the hell he's gone, because he's in that early stage of growth where your business growth has done probably 1,000% ROI for the first year or two, um, and then it'll slowly, yeah. And then crypto is the other thing that maintains more than 15%. Bitcoin alone, the world's most boring crypto, has a 200% CAGR compound annual growth rate over the last 10 years. Beautiful, and it's boring as hell. Um, so, yeah, business and crypto. That's why I'm a, you've got to be obsessed about 15%. And really, 25%. Like I'm, if you talk to me about any asset that makes less than 25%, I sort of go to sleep inside, uh, which is why, sorry, I know a lot of you are property investors, but pff, it's hard as hell to make a, a solid 25% a year year on, year out with property. I know there's rent to rent, service accommodation, deal, deal sourcing. There's loads of different things, um, but yeah, I, just, I just don't like it. And the thing is, going back to the inflation stuff, we're, we're being lied to by the people that they award. I mean, this is <laughs> Paul Grigman. By 2005 or so, it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. N Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman. I, honestly, there are so many occasions of Nobel Prize winners being so freaking wrong, it's ridiculous. So, yeah, I have a distinct, chronic distrust of the establishment, because they just lie to you. They, and, yeah, they just lie. Now, you're probably thinking, yeah, I get what you're saying, Simon, but I've worked my guts off. I've now got a really high-paid job, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, wh wh in fact, where's Adam? I bumped into Adam Ross earlier. Adam Higgins. Oh, so, anyway. So you are an incredibly well-qualified um, and paid dentist, right? So if you want your teeth sm not smashed in, um, <laughs> sorry, if you want your teeth smashed in, go to Adam. Now, I have no idea what you earn, but let, what, what would you say the highest earning dentist in the UK is earning? What? 800 grand a year? Highest. I'm in the wrong sector. No. Okay, okay, let's take bloody Billy Big Balls dentist, 800 grand a year. Wow, I was, I was expecting something like, you know, 100 grand or 150K. Is that, wait, wait, just to clarify this, this 800K superstar, are they making their business in business or being a dentist? Wow, okay, that is mind blowing. Okay, is that dentist, is their income growing more than 15% per year? Okay, I wish I never brought you up. Uh, so, ignore Adam. <laughs> no, no. Well, that is that. You learn something every day. Jesus. Yeah. So the thing is, what I was going to say, like, t take an airline pilot. You know, you don't. You, it's rare to find an airline pilot making more than say 150 grand a year. Their income, although you know, you would have thought I've hit the top of the food chain here. I've done well in school, done all my grades, gone to uni, blah 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 blah. Now 150k salary, which you know. For most people, like 99.99% of the population, 150K salary is freaking amazing. But that salary is not growing by 15% per year. Ignore the superstar dentist. Um, so, and, and it's the golden trap. And I know so many people in high-powered, high-paying jobs going, I know what you're saying, Simon, but I'm comfy. But the thing is, being comfy, you end up as, oh dear, I've gone back too far, that frog. You're comfy for now. Will you be comfy in 10, 15 years' time when you end up, well, when the country ends up some like Argentina? And the last cuddle we spoke about, Argentina. So will a high earner outpace dilution, is the answer, or is the question, and the answer is no. 99.9999% of <laughs> outcomes. And Michael Saylor, Bitcoin Jesus, has this really good analogy. So let's say you have got, I don't know, roughly 10 pints of blood in your body, and I take a pint of blood from you, so 10% of your blood. You are going to have a reduced ability, athletic ability or capability because you have less red blood cells. And so your, your blood or your system as a whole is only absorbing less, or is absorbing less oxygen. So if you were to go and climb a mountain straight after a 10% blood extraction, you're going to be in trouble, right? Now, let's say you own a dojo of fighters and I'm the big nasty government, and I come along and go, right, I want a, 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 a pint of blood from all of your fighters. Go. 
Well, the thing is, you are athletically diminished for four to six weeks. So, you know, one blood outtake is, is fine, but what if I want it every month? I want a pint of blood from all your fighters every single month. How do you think that dojo is going to perform in a big fist fight um, <laughs> in a year's time? Not very well. So that's at 10%. When you look at dilution across loads of other countries, it's 100% sometimes. So dilution is basically extracting blood from the economy. But it's not just the blood. It's also the oxygen within that blood. So. Uh, this is, by the way, Argentina. I cannot do a presentation without this, uh, this chart. Every time I print it or, or take a screenshot, it gets bigger. The, at the last cuddle, it was 97 Argentinian pesos to the dollar. Right now, it's 108. Yeah, it was 108. That is just going up. So if you are that airline pilot living on top of the world thinking you've made it, just research Argentina because those high-earning, high-powered jobs are now poor. They are literally penniless, pretty much. The, the rich-poor divide in Argentina is just absurd. So economic energy to currency is what oxygen is to blood, OK? So let's, let's rewind this. So you can have a currency in, a, in, a, in an economy. That's fine. But what if that economy is doing jack shit? What if there's no productivity? What if, there's no, uh, what if that economy is just fat, lazy, thumb and bum, mind in neutral, just doing nothing. There won't be any productivity or economic energy. So yes, you can have a currency, but for a currency to be worth anything, you need economic energy. I, the country needs to be freaking doing something productive. So <clears throat> economic energy in this example is oxygen to the blood, OK? So yeah, you can have blood, but blood is useless to you if there's zero oxygen in that blood, OK? You'll die. So let's take this one step further. <coughs> if economic energy to currency is what oxygen is to blood, the blood, the, the, uh, currency to an economy, sorry, is like blood to your body. Pointless having blood in your body if there's no oxygen within it. So if you, you can either lose the blood or lose the oxygen or both, you're going to be in a hell a hole of pain. So oxygen, blood, and body is basically economic energy to a currency to an economy. So what's happening right now? What, what is happening right now? We are having the oxygen sucked out of the blood and the blood being extracted from the economy. That, that's exactly what's happening right now. So economic energy is falling off a cliff. Currency is expanding into oblivion as in that's the equivalent of um, having blood taken out of the, your, uh, the economy, and the economy is turning into a big ballot bang of poo. Um, and so it's just like an airplane. Like, if all of a sudden there's rapid decompression, and you know, an oxygen mask falls off, you know, comes down from the ceiling, what are you going to do? You're going to put that freaking mask on your face, aren't you? Um, do yours first, then others. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and that's what's happening right now. Bitcoin is that oxygen mask. Bitcoin is the only thing really out there, or crypto as a whole, which is the thing that bypasses the oxygen extraction from the blood and the blood extraction from the, from the body. So this is what's happening. We're, we're having economic entropy. So we are, we are fought, or we are fighting and are, have fought all sorts of wars. We had the war against COVID. We've had World War III over the last two years, but people don't, don't really realize it. Except World War III wasn't with nukes. It was against this thing we can't see. And, and so the whole world has spent trillions fighting COVID and lockdown. What has lockdowns done to economic energy? It is the thing that stops economic energy, by the way. Um, we've had benefits going absolutely nuts um, in, in, the, in the form of COVID payments and you know, um, all of the grants that we've been having. So the, you know, most countries around the world have been giving out money for, for doing nothing to a degree, just to, to live. The global supply chain has just been you know, kicked off its perch and is still, still reeling after 2020. We're having war now, which really doesn't help. Commodity costs are going up as a result of war. Energy costs, again, is, is going up. Um, and what is sovereign income across the world doing? It's going down. Does any of the, does, can anyone see this turning into a nice outcome? It's not. Um, 
Remember, but please remember the first slide of today. We are all meaningless and we're worth nothing and everything we do is completely insignificant. So don't get too over uh, caught up with all this uh, economic entropy. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, uh, things aren't bad. We are in that plane. We've had a rapid decompression and the oxygen and the air have been sucked out of the cabin. We need that oxygen mask. And if you're gonna just sit there completely neutral and do nothing, you're going to asphyxiate and die. And that's what's happening. We're having a global asphyxiation, um, as in lack of oxygen to the brain. So it's not good. And so once COVID was over, they needed something else to go to war with. So um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Again, please don't hate me. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's, it's funny, it's more realistic than you think, that, that, those two funny pictures. <clears throat> but the thing is with war, is remember, what do humans do? We fight wars we don't want to fight, and we fund it with money we, we don't have. There's two things, we fight wars we don't really want, and we fund it with money we don't have. How do you pay for a war? There's only two ways you pay for a war. In fact, I've already answered this, oh shit. I was going to ask you, where did taxes originate from hundreds and hundreds of years ago? War. So what you, in fact, it was the Britons that created tax. Oh, no, it wasn't. Sorry. It, we, we mastered tax, but we didn't create tax. It was really the Romans that really sort of innovated tax. So what happened is that back in the Roman times, uh, there would be no tax. You know, you could live your life free of tax. And then the emperor would go to war. Right, we want to take out the Gauls. And so... They would need to you know, rally up you know, 10 to 50,000 troops, and that would need money. So what did they do? The emperor would then tax the local citizens, and, and that would then pay for the campaign to go and take out France. So you, you pay for war in two ways. You either do taxation on the economy, or you do stealth tax. What is stealth tax? It's diluting the currency supply. But that happened next. This was like the... This, Stealth tax came around when humans realized people don't actually like going to war. So what happens is that, you know, that, you know they do use propaganda. Hey, we need to go to war. We need, here's a tax. And the, the local populace will put up with it for about three years. Three to four years is typically how long a, a, a nation would, as in the, the people of the nation, would put up with a war. Um, because what happens is the tax always increases. It's never, this is a flat rate tax. It's like, shit, we need more money. We need more money. We need more money. And historically, for thousands of years, after about four years of being taxed, the public says, no, we don't want to go to war anymore. We're fighting war with a country I've never even been to. I don't even know what you're doing. I'm not going to tax. We're not going to pay. So people stopped paying their taxes. So what did the Roman emperors do back in the day when their, their, their people just said no? Oh, they, they killed a lot of them, but yeah. Um, <laughs> they diluted the currency supply. They did the stealth tax. So what did they do? They started um, mixing in the, the, the metals with the currency. So they either started clipping some of the coins or they just changed the coins completely. Instead of having silver coins, they had silver-coated coins. So they'd have like uh, brass, uh, uh, yeah, brass was also some of the coins. Uh, and what happens is when you dilute the currency and you swap, swap coins from silver to brass to zinc or, or whatever, um, what happens to that currency? You've basically just stripped it completely and it's the, the, their equivalent of QE. And guess what? When you do another four years of crazy currency dilution, then you have the shit hitting, hitting the fan. So a nation will only put up with four to five years of war, if they're being taxed for it. But the nation, if you then do a stealth tax, the nation will figure that out in four to five years. It's no coincidence, by the way, that most major wars on the planet last about five years. Vietnam, Korea, World War I, World War II, um, yeah, other than the Hundred Year War with <laughs> England, that's slightly different. But most of the big wars out there, they're only four to five year things. Um, and when they do stealth tax, the public, the dumb, even the idiot in the street will realize stealth tax after five years, after they've been rinsing the currency supply heavy for five years. Well, guess what? 2020, 2020 was World War III with COVID. We're only, what, a year into this. The public is starting to sort of figure this out. But what do you think? I reckon by 2025, we are really going to feel the consequences of, uh, of lockdowns and all of the money, money printing that's happening right now. Um, 
So yeah, they're doing sales tax. The, the, they don't even bother asking us for increased taxes for war. They just do it the, the stealth way. So what happens, and this is the downwards death spiral of doom, you have war. Remember, you have war you don't want to fight, and you pay it with money you don't have. You do the stealth tax. That increases, uh, that, that stealth tax is monetary inflation, as in expanding the currency supply, and that causes price inflation. Remember, price is that big old sponge that you know, pops up later. That then eventually, after about five years of crazy, crazy money printing, creates a massive trust loss in, or lack of confidence. M money is basically confidence. Um, they lose confidence in the system. You then have an economic crash, and then you have a reset. Kel Surpris, World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab. So this is, again, another meme. Memes are actually quite funny. Uh, they're funny because they're ironically true. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going through this war at the moment. So we're, we're having two wars, the, the, the new hot war that's emerging, and we're still fighting this COVID war. And the economic crisis is basically going to be the nasty tail end of all the money printing that's happening to fund all of this. And as the head of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, says, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. Please get his book. He's on Amazon right now. It's like 9 99 It's called The Great Reset. The playbook of what's going to happen over the next 10, 15 years is in that book. It's not conspiracy rubbish. There's no tin hat in sight here. This is coming from the horse's mouth. He is the horse. He's granddaddy horsey. So... Just read, read his book, read his freaking book, <laughs> um, and you'll, you, you'll understand where everything is going, including CBDCs. He lays it out in there as well. Oh, it's, it's got a in there. yes, it's definitely worth reading a few times. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would, it's mandatory research, mandatory. If you, if you give a shit about your finances and your family's future, you need to read that book. So, tumultuous times ahead, it's terminal. The, the, the world has cancer, unfortunately, uh, and crypto is the, is the oxygen mask. So that is my long-winded um, explanation of Bitcoin as economic energy.